This is the story of Starship's first integrated flight test. Now, I don't usually cover rockets on this channel. I've covered the space shuttle a couple of times and you guys seem to love it. So here's a video about SpaceX's Starship. But before we can talk about the world's largest rocket blowing up 24 miles up in the skies over Texas, we need to talk about what Starship exactly is. Back in the day, Elon Musk wanted to send a greenhouse to Mars. Why you ask? Because Elon's gonna Elon. But he quickly realized that rocket launches were way too expensive. So he asked the Russians if he could buy an ICBM off of them. So that, you know, Elon could get his Mars plan off of the ground. Pun intended. But the Russians obviously laughed him out of the room. I mean, wouldn't you? But before we go further, let me thank our sponsor, War Thunder. Without their support, this would not be possible. You've heard me talk about War Thunder before. It's the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. You can play more than 2,000 planes, ships, tanks, and amazing PvP battles. Everything is modeled right down to the last rivet for amazing immersion. And the best thing is you can play it on Xbox, PC, and the PS5, and other last-gen consoles. Since the last time I talked about War Thunder, here are some things that I've absolutely liked about the game. I've fallen in love with the customization that the game offers. It allows you to place historical markings for that added level of authenticity. And the action-packed PvP matches are something you just must experience. Use my link and get a large free bonus pack. In addition to that, get multiple premium vehicles, premium account, boosters, and so much more. Keep in mind that the bonuses are available for new players and players who have been inactive for six months or more. And you can get the bonuses both on PC and consoles. So go check them out with the link in the description. Now, back to the story. Once the Russians had told Elon no, this made him create SpaceX in 2002. Fast forward a bit, SpaceX gets to orbit with the Falcon 1 and they build the Falcon 9 with a lot of help from NASA and they slowly start landing the boosters from 2015 onwards. They develop the Falcon Heavy at around this time to lob some truly massive payloads into space. But Elon wants to get to Mars, and for that he'd need a rocket that's absolutely massive, the likes of which the world literally has never seen before. Something that would make the Falcon Heavy, which had not flown at that time, look like a child's toy. And so the ITS program was revealed as a concept in 2016. The ITS, or the Interplanetary Transport System, called for an absolutely gargantuan rocket that was fully reusable. That was nuts. You see, up to this point, SpaceX had only gotten to partial reusability. A rocket that allowed for reuse of the second stage and the first stage was the holy grail of rocketry. The ITS then went through a couple of iterations before they landed on the design that they're building right now. An upper stage that has four flaps two in the front, two in the back, that launches atop the super heavy booster and then re-enters the atmosphere and then uses the flaps to control itself, kind of like a skydiver. The falling upper stage would then be caught by a tower with two long arms, and the community has dubbed them the chopsticks. The tower itself is called Mechazilla. I am not making this up. These are the actual plans. The booster is supposed to do what the Falcon 9 booster does, Go up, flip itself around and perform a boost backburn, and come in for a landing. Instead of the booster landing on its own legs like the Falcon 9 does, Mechazillo is supposed to catch the booster as well. Like just to reiterate, I'm not making this up. These are the official plans of SpaceX. So with the design finalized, I'm putting finalized in air quotes right now because the rocket is constantly evolving from one prototype to the other, but we'll get to that later. They started building the thing out in Boca Chica, Texas. Starship uses a unique engine, the Raptor. The Raptor is the world's first full-flow stage combustion methalox engine. That's a lot of words, but what it means is that unlike most engines which uses either hydrogen or kerosene, the Raptor uses methane, which not a whole lot of rocket engines use. It was only recently that a methane-powered rocket reached orbit. All of this meant that it took a lot of engines blowing up to make sure that SpaceX's Raptor engine was reliable enough to put on a rocket booster. Now, speaking of that booster, the Super Heavy booster has, at the time of recording, 33 Raptor engines. That's an absolutely mind-boggling number of engines, which handily beats the Soviet N1, which had 30 engines. Don't get me wrong though, these Raptor engines are powerful. 
Recently, they fired all the engines of Super Heavy for a static fire before flight test number two at 50% thrust. This thing at 50% thrust is more powerful than the Saturn V, the rocket that took us to the moon and back. The Starship vehicle has an additional six Raptor engines. If you aren't in awe of this machine just yet, just know that everything that you're looking at right now was built in a field in Texas under a tent. The Starship is truly an incredible machine. With all of that preface out of the way, we can finally get to what happened on 420. That is the 20th of April, 2023. The Starship was ready for its integrated flight test. This was the first time that the entire stack of the booster and ship would be tested together. As always, firing up the world's largest and most powerful rocket came with its own risks. An explosion on the pad would be like setting off a mini nuke near the town of Boca Chica. So everyone was evacuated and with everyone out of the way, the booster and the ship frosted up as the tanks were filled with liquid methane and liquid oxygen. As the clock ticked down, everyone checked out the ship and booster as best as they could. They verified that everything was in the green and they were ready to stand down if needed. In fact, this wasn't the first launch attempt of Starship. They had tried just three days ago on the 17th of April, but they had to hold down for certain reasons. And this was attempt number two. But attempt number two looked a lot better than attempt number one. It really looked like we might make it all the way through the countdown this time around. The countdown dropped all the way to T-minus 40 seconds. And this was a huge deal for the launch as this is when Mission Control did their final checks on the vehicle. If the launch was going to be called off, T-minus 40 was the place to do it. But to the relief of nerds everywhere, the clock continued ticking down after a while. The launch was imminent now. But then, at T-27 seconds, they called for a hold. They needed to check everything else one last time before they decided to send it. Now, SpaceX didn't really care about this booster and this ship. It was outdated by the time it had gotten to the launch pad. But they really cared about the launch pad. If the ship blew up or flew into the launch tower, it would set the program back months, if not years. After a couple of minutes of baited waiting, the clock resumed. Starship was good to go. Then, just seconds before the clock hit zero, the outer bank of 33 engines fired up. Then, the inner banks came online. The flight computer did a quick checkout. Three engines didn't fire, but it had enough engines for the flight, and the flight computer and mission control released the clamps. The Starship slid off the launch pad, like literally slid off of it due to the thrust asymmetry. It left behind a cloud of smoke and dust. The ship slowly started to ascend. At T plus 13 seconds, the ship cleared the pad. Flight test one was a success. SpaceX wanted to clear the pad, and that's what they did. But as the crowds cheered, you could see that Starship's exhaust was quite bright. You could see that at T plus 29 seconds, something blew up. One engine just flared bright white, but despite that, the stack still kept going. You could see that something was going wrong in that area, but the ship was picking up speed, and it was heading out over the ocean. So, even if everything went wrong, no one would be in danger. By 53 seconds into the flight, one engine was self-destructing into the exhaust plume. But as I mentioned before, the rocket kept going, so they let it go. It was accelerating slower than expected, but that's to be expected due to all of the engines that had gone down. But despite that, the ship went through another major milestone. It went through max Q, or the period of maximum aerodynamic pressure. This was a huge validation of the design of Starship. The rocket was at 10 kilometers of altitude at this point. Despite multiple engines being out, Starship still kept climbing. No one had really expected them to make it this far. But now it was coming time to separate the booster from the Starship so that the booster could make its way back to the coast. But separation did not happen. Instead, the whole stack started tumbling. I was watching this live and thought that the booster had flipped to head back without the Starship separating. For whatever reason, the booster and ship started rotating with the engine still running. I think that people expected the whole thing to just break apart at that point, but it didn't. The linkages between the ship and the booster held up against all odds. By now, it was clear that Starship would not be getting to orbit on its first attempt. As the ship tumbled, you could see wisps of white liquid being ejected from the stack as it tumbled. This was the flight termination system being triggered. Explosives in both the ship and booster had now blown giant holes in the fuel tanks. That is when the ship blew up. Just kidding. It initially looked like the flight termination system had no effect on the stack. It was just tumbling out of control. 
It took 40 seconds for the ship to finally break apart. And with that, the first flight of Starship had come to an end. An end that included rocket debris raining down into the Atlantic Ocean from an altitude of 40 kilometers. Now, I never really intended to make this video because I never thought that we'd get anything close to a public investigation from this incident. But I was somewhat wrong. We were told exactly what went wrong on the first flight. Just to reiterate, this was a smashing success. The one thing that everyone wanted was for the ship to clear the tower, and that happened. Everything after that was just bonus data. The only thing that really failed on this flight was the flight termination system. Can you imagine if the stack was headed towards a populated area, and the flight termination took 40 seconds to actually destroy the vehicle? Yeah, that would have been bad. To that extent, after the first flight, SpaceX basically took a prototype fuel tank, strapped an upgraded flight termination system to it, and then blew it up to make sure that next time, it will work as intended. So, why did the launch go sideways, literally? Well, it really came down to some fire. Here's a quote from the update that SpaceX gave us. Quote, During ascent, the vehicle sustained fires from leaking propellant in the aft end of Super Heavy Booster which eventually severed the connection with the vehicle's primary flight computer. This led to a loss of communications to the majority of booster engines and ultimately control of the vehicle." End quote. Basically, there were leaks in the booster and the methane caught on fire and the resultant fire was so bad that it basically severed the connection between the engines and the flight computer. So for a portion of the flight, the flight computer had no way of controlling the rocket. Now, this is all the information that we thought we were going to get, but then Elon had a slight misunderstanding with the FAA and ended up tweeting the entire list of 63 improvements that were identified by SpaceX and then ratified by the FAA. If you look at that, a lot of the improvements are just about making sure that the ship and booster are more leak-proof. Replace certain fittings with welds inside tank, increase fire suppression capacity by 15x, increase scrutiny on leak checks, that sort of thing. Now, as I write this, SpaceX has another booster and ship pair ready to go, and they are massively upgraded. The engines have better shielding, the engine controls have been reinforced, and they are now using electric thrust vector control instead of hydraulic ones. The engines are newer, and a whole host of other improvements, literally thousands of them. Could this really be the Starship that finally reaches orbit? Will it survive re-entry? I don't think so, but let me know what you think in the comments below. But before we close out, go check out War Thunder at the link in the description. Again, thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It'll really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.